Welcome to today's webinar, Aligning Company Objectives and Stock Placement, with our corporate member Michael Page and our Queensland Chapter President. I'm Monique Fennec from Australasian Supply Chain Institute. And before we introduce our keynote, I'd like to run through some housekeeping tips for the webinar. Firstly, uh, a technical check to ensure that everyone can hear me. Please raise your hand if you can hear me. Fantastic. Thank you. And you can see in the chat box that I've sent a greeting to you all and you can communicate to us via this chat box if you have any te technical difficulties throughout the webinar. Two other housekeeping items. We'll be running some polls during the webinar, which we will publish anonymous results. So help us to keep today as interactive as possible and respond to those polls. The Q&A section is not anonymous. Instead, it allows for you to post your questions to the panel and for other attendees to see. Please use this opportunity to provide answers to um, some of your questions in this webinar. There'll be plenty of time at the end to share responses to the panel. We'll be awarding one CPD point to attendees from today's webinar. Just type CPD into the Q&A box so that we know you require a point to go towards your registration or certification maintenance. The webinar is recorded and will be uploaded to the ASCII Resources Library for members tomorrow and a Slow Moving Parts closed LinkedIn group post will be created for further discussions with our keynotes after today's webinar to continue the discussion. To kickstart the webinar, may I introduce our co-host for today, Bree Clements. So just an introduction to Bree. Bree is Associate Manager, Engineering and Procurement for Michael Page. Bree's over 10 years of recruitment experience across multiple industries. And Bree's remit spans Brisbane and Queensland in procurement, temporary and permanent appointments and some other areas um, of specialty as well. So I'll ask you, Bree, to unmute yourself and um, give your market update, please. Thanks, Monique. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. It's great to see such a great turnout. Um, on behalf of Fergus Cox and myself, and Fergus is the manager of supply chain here in Brisbane at Michael Page, just wanted to provide a couple of quick updates about what we're seeing in the market. A lot of this information will be Queensland centric, so forgive me if you are interstate. Um, we've seen a lot of increased discussion over the past few weeks with businesses starting to plan post-COVID. Um, and there's a lot of talk in the supply chain industry about bringing on planning professionals and consultants to help to continue to mature the supply chain function, which is really exciting. In Queensland, we've seen some constant business processes and recruitment during COVID. This has primarily been in defence, utilities, transport and logistics and food production, as well as construction, supply industries, mining and mining um, support industries. And we've definitely seen a spike in other states around FMCG and different hardware processes. We have, as I'm sure you'd be aware, see, seen a general reduction in advertisements and recruited roles over the last two months. However, really exciting. Um, we're starting to see some real signs of life back in the Brisbane market, um, the broader Queensland market, and some signs in the state as we have more notifications from the government about what the future will look like post COVID. Um, if you haven't checked it out yourself, check out SEEK. There are so many more adverts on there than there have been in the last couple of months. And it's really lovely to see that the market is slowly returning. Um, we've also had a lot of conversations about what the operational requirements will be for our supply chain businesses as we return to work. These have been everything, um, you know, from what will be operationally required, being split shifts, increased cleaning, um, and what a business will require to make sure their staff are really safe and safety being the number one priority. Um, we have also seen that those key facts that were holding true last webinar, that people were laying off casuals and reducing hours and salary, this is ongoing, but we do start to see a light at the end of the tunnel with many of our primary clients. And we've also seen um, that about 20% of our clients are currently hiring, which is again, really, really exciting. So as always, we're here to offer any support. Uh, if you need any help at all at any time, please don't hesitate to call Fergus or myself. Um, and that could just be a market update or some insights as to what's going on. We are always here to help. So that's me. Thanks so much, Monique. 
Great. And we've just launched a poll too, Bree, to give you some more information from the attendees to today's webinar. We've got 70 attending today and it, it keeps going up actually. So some latecomers coming in. Um, if you've just joined us, um, please feel free to enter this anonymous poll and let us know where what industry you're from, but also uh, what your hiring plans are going to be. And I'll share those results with you in about three seconds. Okay, so Brie, you can see, um, and no surprises, that there's a lot from the industrial machinery, parts and components uh, in industries today, um, given today's topic. And from the hiring, no plans to hire, but there's plenty that are not applicable as well. So just not sure what the um, organization's plans are for hiring. So thanks everyone for joining in that poll. Yeah. So now um, I'm really pleased to introduce um, our ASCII Queensland Chapter President, James Scotland, currently engaged by the Australian Industry Group and the Federal Department of Industry Innovation and Science as National Supply Chain Facilitator. James's role is to assist and enable SMEs to prepare for and to access global supply chains. His clients include Volvo Group Australia, Shell, QGC, Bus Tech Australia, and the Australian Organics Industry. The focus of that role is in the digital integration along and across the supply chain continuum. James's management consulting experience, training with companies such as BHP and Rio Tinto, and CEO of a vocational training organisation at University of Southern Queensland, Toowoomba. James uh, has worked his way up to group regional manager at Maine Nicholas Express Freight Group, which is now Toll, based in Darwin. These roles were 3PL operations, including running 24-hour operations of air freight, road freight and couriers, and included building relationships with clients and working across organisational silos with clients and within Maine Nicholas. In NT, James was chairman of the International Business Council, the chairman of Australian Industry Defence Network, board member of NT Chamber of Commerce and Industry, chairman of the Oil and Gas Network and president of the Australian Institute of Management in Northern Territory. We're very fortunate to have James leading our Queensland chapter. Um, I'll ask you now, James, to unmute yourself and over to you. Well, thank you, Monique, and uh, well said, Bree. It was nice to get that industry briefing. Welcome, everyone. I hope everyone is staying safe and staying well. And I hope that you're seeing opportunities in your supply chain uh, presented by the COVID challenges. Wherever there's a challenge, there's an opportunity. I'm excited about this topic today. We know that uh, because of COVID, air freight is going to be limited coming into and out of Australia for the foreseeable future until mid next year. It's going to be five times the cost or more. It's currently five times it may go up uh, because of limited uh, airline and air freight operations. Sea freight is going to be difficult as well as people move from air freight to sea freight and there'll be a lack of capacity in sea freight. So we're going to have supply chain challenges and this means that our inventory is going to be an opportunity and or, and or a challenge. So I think today's topic is welcome and timely and I'm really excited to hear what we can learn. Before I get to that though, perhaps uh, Monique might be a good idea to talk about uh, ASCII, Australasian Supply Chain Institute. Supply chain is becoming a specific um, requirement in an organization. Many companies are saying that supply chain is their point of difference. And ASCII's role is to train and develop professional supply chain managers. We are the not-for-profit accreditation body for supply chain management. We're committed to developing the skills and knowledge of today's uh, professional supply chain and business improvement managers. We want to do this at all levels, from line operators all the way to the boardroom. Let's make supply chain professionalism professional. 
business professionals are keen to develop, who are, who are keen to develop their skills, their knowledge and their competencies can register in one of the three pillars of supply chain um, management, which is kind of like operations, logistics or procurement, uh, or known as ILS if you're in the defense sector, and then complete their training in order to be acknowledged by a post nominal as a professional supply chain manager. You can see the post nominals there on the screen. I think one of the things is about supply chain management in the modern world is that uh, we're helping, supply chain itself is changing and adapting and our managers need the skills and knowledge that will help them to help their companies to pivot and adapt. This ASCII certification provides you with this skill and we're very proud of it. And just as, um, and just as, uh, as modern business needs to change and adapt, uh, the training is provided in a changeable and adaptable way. You can focus on just one specific part of the supply chain, or you can study it from end to end, uh, supply chains from end to end that is. You can also choose the method and platform for study. One of the exciting ways of studying is a hybrid solution, which means you can study at home, do self-study, uh, and then once a week get onto a weekly online certification review evening class where you can mix with peers doing the same study. The next course, I mentioned that because the next course starts in July. So now really is the time to start applying for your professional accreditation. If you want to know more, there's a QR code on the screen. If you are watching by the recorded version of this podcast, or if you're on the live version, you receive an information pack in an email shortly after the webinar. I encourage you to think about doing your professional training as soon as possible. Supply chain's changing. Let's keep our professional knowledge up to date. And speaking about up to date, that brings us uh, to our keynote speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Mark Watson, Group Forecasting and Planning Manager for the Enenco Group. He'll explain uh, the company, uh, which is pretty impressive. I've been dealing with them on and off for years. And Mark has had 20 years experience of all aspects of supply chain planning in industries that have varied from uh, fast moving consumer goods to gaming, dairy, commodities, and now he's in industrial wholesale. What a, what a career. And at the same time, Mark has worked across demand to plant production planning in both consultancy and operational roles and in a variety of countries. He's been involved in planning system designs, implementation and improvements. Mark's experience enables him to identify those things that are common or are different to each planning problem and to then design a process or a team and a solution that can be undertaken by the planners themselves in a practical manner. This webinar is going to uh, address a topical issue and we're done by a true professional. Can we welcome, please, to the virtual stage, Mark Watson. Hello. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Not only safe and well, but warm today as well. Um, so let me get started. Um, first of all, is just introductions about who we are as the Anenko Group. Uh, Monique, I'm just not able to click through those slides. There we go. So the company was a family started business in 1954, uh, very much focused on bearings and PT product. Um, it grew by itself to start with, and a big leap became uh, through acquisition of its primary competitor. And then that suddenly accelerated through the mid 2000s to what you see today. Uh, across the geographies of Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, $600 million of sales and 1800 employees. But perhaps more pertinent to today is the uh, the large SKU count, uh, location count, and uh, and the item warehouses ultimately they create. So as a group, uh, this is like a, a marketing manager's dream, I suspect. We are now fully owned by a genuine parts company uh, based in Atlanta in the USA. Here in Australia, they also own brands such as Repco, which would be more familiar to most. The Enanco Group itself, though, is a collection of other brands through those acquisitions. Uh, I'm going to be concentrating most of my experience on the CBC and BSE companies. Uh, however, the rest is, is also in there. Below the line, 
are the major brands that we then sell. We are essentially a, uh, an industrial supermarket, so we sell other people's products very much in that uh, distributor space. Now, one of the reasons the range is so broad is, uh, or the sort of the planning problem is so broad is we cover a wide variety of product types and we also service a wide variety of customers and different industries. Uh, some of that breadth is caused by the environment, the technical requirements of those products, and then just the diverse nature between uh, you know, agriculture, uh, recycling plants, uh, and all their uh, specific needs. Uh, in not unusual cases, we're also servicing machines that were perhaps cobbled together in the 1930s and 40s and still expect a full service review. Specifically from a planning and uh, an inventory situation, over 400,000 active SKUs, but from a wider catalog of 700 plus, 700,000, our motion industries counterpart in the US has over a million active SKUs and 7 million in their catalog. So a small fry compared to them. However, from a planning perspective, it's more specific to the item warehouses or the skull list. Uh, we have 3.7 million of those. Now, the vast majority of those, whilst it's a large number, are what I would refer to as idle. However, we must have to continue doing the master data maintenance to those because every now and again, they have a habit of waking up and we need to make sure that we still know what to do. In the, the latest sweep of those, we have just over 400,000 with stock, but a much smaller number that should have stock. Not to say that all those other missing ones uh, shouldn't. They could be orders in and out in a non-stocked capacity. Um, but we also do have a lot of stock left over from previous, um, I say, sales ideas. So very large scale list, all require maintenance, a much smaller and, uh, and therefore practical way of actually having to plan those when you get down to the few hundred thousand. Our stock turns are around about the 2.5 for the whole group. However, we do have some fast ranges and fast in our turn would be six stock turns. We also have others that turn every six, seven or eight years, which is hardly a turn at all. However, much more of a critical spare for our customer. For the industrial solutions vision, those CBC and BSC brands I mentioned on earlier slides, approximately 185,000 distinct SKUs sold in any given year, and half of those will not sell in the following 12 months. To see just how slow we are, and almost to sort of prove that I, I think I'm welcome in this slot, is the graphs you see today is a comparison of the, uh, the number of items sold, you know, the number of order counts per year. So around about a third or more of our items have one sales order per year. And the little blip at the end is a very small number that have 50 or more orders per year. And that profile hasn't changed at all in 15 years, which sort of goes with the, the slow moving aspect. However, how we manage those has changed rapidly and drastically, uh, especially in the last five or six years. So whilst the, the overall nature of slowness retains, how we're constantly looking at it, trying to skinny up our stock, reposition our stock, which I'll get into here, has created a lot of innovation and change within not only the software you, we use, but how we structure our team and view things. Now, this really came from the, uh, the first, and I think only face-to-face -face meeting of this group, which was a broad discussion about how to manage slow moving items. And uh, Peter from Karasaki actually posed the question to many of us was saying, well, what's your goal? Different people in different parts of the supply chain have a different need for inventory. Uh, in the distribution space, ideally, we'd like to make some money out of inventory. However, more of as a consumer, especially if you're in a, uh, well, we have electrical uh, mining, for example, you might have a different need for that inventory, not to necessarily deliver a profit in its own right, but to deliver um, uptime of machinery. So what I've put down in here is just some common but non-exclusive um, uh, measures for different types. And Monique, if you'd be able to show a poll, it'd be interesting for myself to get uh, the sort of measures that different people are using when it comes to their, uh, to their inventory measures.
So if you'd be able to complete that poll for us, what I'll do is take some of that and put that back onto the, uh, the, the user group afterwards. From our perspective, we've focused on a measure that we refer to as earn and turn is also sometimes uh, called GIMROI or gross margin return on inventory. They're subtly different, but essentially aim for the same thing, which is to look to see if you're getting a return out of your inventory. Uh, the most important message for this though is make sure you have selected the right goal for yourself and that your metrics and your behaviors are aligned to that goal. Um, certainly from our perspective, we had a mismatch between the primary goals given and the way we were, um, I suppose, managing ourselves. So DIFOT, very high number there. Um, although also conscious that DIFOT is a measure of many other things, not just the availability of inventory, but operational excellence as well for the delivery of it. So specifically for our situation, We've arrived at this goal of earn and turn, which is a very simplistic measure of what is your GP percentage derived from your sales versus your stock turns. And we picked on this because if you just pick a singular measure of stock turn, for example, and you're essentially treating everything equal, um, if you just take GP as our sales attitude was, then the cost of inventory is, is blind and therefore irrelevant to that sort of thinking. And our situation sees us have lead times from immediate to three years. We have an expectation that most of our branches that everything is within their reach, uh, regardless of the, the frequency of sale. Every sale is a good sale, obviously. And the GP percentage mindset for sales where inventory dollars was the primary metric for supply chain. And therefore we were constantly at odds with each other. By using a, an earn and turn measure, we're able to actually make sure that we're holding stock of high, high returning product. It also changes our thinking into how to react to slow moving or slow margin items. We do classify our items both uh, like an ABC type classification. Our terminology is pop for popularity. It is based on the sales frequency and number of customers we sell through to. It's possible to introduce more options we have limitations with just how our master data is set up that prevents us from using a, a true gross margin, but that would be a, a very good one for us to use to help ABC or, or pop code our item numbers because that will flavor how you then respond to it. Now, just to talk more about the end turn in, in case it's a new measure for many. Uh, let me just try and get that slide to move forward. Thank you. So the end and turn has got three elements only. And ideally is simple enough for those in the sales, product management and supply chain team to, to fully understand and understand where we can uh, move the dials accordingly. In this representation of it, those three elements are the corners of your, your cost of goods, the GP percentage derived from the sales and your inventory value. Taking the dotted line through the center, is to try to get as much of this triangle above that dotted line as possible. So you can obviously do that by pushing your cogs and your GPs or getting your inventory closer, therefore lower. The rep representations on the right hand side would show you just some formats on how to derive a better earn and turn measure. For example, lift your cogs, same GP, same inventory would still help. Uh, alternatively, pushing the price, uh, getting GP improvements or reducing your inventory. Any combination that results in more of that triangle being above that central line is what we're seeking. Now we're also trying to sort of pick a, a sweet spot for, for this and try to find out where, you know, what I would refer to as a corridor. I've taken in this example, a range of 90 to 150 uh, from some reading that I've done, distribution, uh, industrial goods, slow moving in, uh, distribution would typically be around about 110 to 120. And using 120 as an example, if you're uh, achieving 40 GP on sales, then you can afford three stock terms. 20 GP, you're forced into six stock terms. So drawing a, a corridor with GP percentage up the side and stock terms down the side, you're, you're trying to place your product, your range, your brand, even your branch, whichever way you try to spin this metric, and it should be within that range. 
anything above doing fantastically well, anything below questionable, hopefully can be justified. But think of the earn and turn target almost in a simplistic break even. If you want uh, 120, as I said, if your sales guys are telling us that you're only getting 20 GP, 30 GP, it's very quick to tell you a minimum stock turns and therefore the minimum stock investment, your, or so the maximum stock investment that you're then able to hold to return that, uh, that metric. So very simplistic, which it sort of has to be if you've got three very opposing teams trying to um, argue about the stock to hold. So to help us uh, focus on that, first of all, I want to describe the evolution of our supply chain. Um, and even what you've got on the screen is not where we started. It was actually impossible for me to draw that in a manner that you'd be able to read. But we did have 27 small uh, warehouses spotted around the country, which was all a duplication of each of our company brands in each state. They had their own ways of working. So ridiculous duplication. About five years ago, we consolidated into four main distribution models, uh, two of which were, were green sites, uh, greenfield sites, sorry, and two just repurposed. And we did then try to prioritize much of our supply through the two primary DCs in Victoria and New South Wales. However, the stock that came into New South Wales or the NDC in this representation then went off to many of the branches direct. And that went into our Victorian DC, VDC, went also to those same branches. So we had a, a primary supply chain for each item, but it became quite messy and very confusing for our branches to know where to go to. So we changed this with some help, but we were worried that if we try to consolidate too much for efficiency reasons, that we'd lose the ability to have stock close by. You'll see in this, uh, in this representation here, our Queensland and WA DCs, we traveled through because if you don't sell or travel through a location, most planning systems I know, in fact, all planning systems I know, would not provide any safety stock requirement or recognition. We wanted to move to consolidate most of our supply through Victoria, but not have all the safety stock removed from those closer DCs. We were able to do that by consolidating our supply through Victoria, uh, whilst faint on this chart, hopefully you can see the difference between the blue supply chain, which is the one that we focus most on for efficiencies and, uh, and, and those efficiency gains. Um, now, whilst it also looks very singular and very much in this period of time, it provides a lot of risk, we do have the ability to quickly swap that point of supply from Victoria to New South Wales to keep us flexible. So we haven't created a single bottleneck of risk here. But that blue supply chain, the product will come into Victoria and go straight to every branch with a couple of exceptions only. But as I said, if we did that, we would lose the ability to hold safety stock in Queensland, New South Wales, and WA. So we, through the use of rules that have created a lot of flexibility for us, we're able to now create locational support stock. And this, had, uh, to be blunt for us, has been quite a game changer in our use of slow moving stock because you don't want to lock product up either in transit or planned days on shelf in say a, a Queensland DC. You want it to go as fast as possible to the branches as well as just pooling the risk of the uncertainty of, say, North Queensland or a, a, a New South Wales metro area. And say, for those unusual odd sales, you don't want to overinflate your stock in all those branches. Instead, create localized pools that those branches can call off in a much quicker, cheaper manner than transferring everything up from as far away as possible. Uh, it should make us, and does make us more, reactive and uh, in be able to service those are areas away from Victoria. So this difference between a primary and a secondary supply chain has, uh, as I, without time to play, has been quite a, a game changer for us. To give you some context on that, taking one of our key brands, over the last couple of years, we've been able to move the stock terms from 2.9 to 4.2, which look you know, pretty unimpressive to many companies. We are in a slow moving range, but that's 39 days of inventory that we've taken out of our end-to-end -end supply chain, just in that one core range, which for us is hundreds of thousands of dollars for this, for this specific brand. 
And we've managed to do that whilst both the COGS and the GP are falling slightly. We've managed to react in a uh, supply chain efficiency in a much, much better way. And so the combination of the stock, not just skinning up the stock, but the placement of it, you can see we've moved that earn and turn metric from what was well below that corridor that I showed before to well and truly above it and above our own metric. So a, a huge improvement from, from that perspective. Improvements of 20% plus in that earn and turn metric are not unusual. Haven't achieved that everywhere. Others are much better than that. Perhaps more importantly, though, we have created much more flexibility, not only in where we place our stock, how we define our supply chain, but also in how we engage with our product management and our buying uh, portfolio management team. So we're much able to sit down, review the supply chain, and work out where our stock should be placed. Now, Monique, there's a second poll that we had available to us now. Because uh, what I'd like to talk about is how this has helped us in reacting during this COVID-19 period. And this specifically is about what's your reaction been to it? I've heard of a variety of companies do different things with, uh, with response to what to do immediately. So I'll be interested in how, how others are, are reacting to this. So from our perspective, perhaps the most important thing and, uh, and beneficial things is it's absolutely confirmed that this metric of earn and turn is right for us. As I mentioned, if we had looked purely at stock turns, then from a supply chain practitioner's perspective, every product would have looked the same. It would have been treated or had the danger of being treated equally. From a sales perspective, if they were just focused on GP percentage, then all stock is good stock. There's, there's no such thing as a, a break on that. And not recognizing that in many cases you can be essentially buying your sales. Uh, we might need to buy 100 because they want to have a good GP on three sales. So it's, it's absolutely confirmed and created the supply chain product management teams coming together. It's very simple and yet it has very powerful results with many, many more, uh, much more potential to come. So it's good to see from that, that poll that many more are, are adjusting the forward sales plan, um, but many also are doing the um, just buy less. And I'll, I'll be interested in sort of getting some further experience, perhaps through that chat room that we have on LinkedIn in, in how these reactions have gone for people. Thank you. So for us, we've confirmed the metric is right for us. During this period of wanting to protect and also generate cash, it's very much bright in the spotlight on the inventory portion of that earn and turn triangle. It doesn't mean that everything that we're doing today is purely about stock reduction, but it's very much keeping us in tandem with our product managers to make sure that if we are reducing our stock, where to do it? Can we centralize back to one of those support locations rather than needing to proliferate ranges through every single branch? Also, because we classify our ABC or pop codes locally, we can be very specific and say, well, this range in this branch needs to be held locally, but the same range in another branch really doesn't have much of a play in it. So we can consolidate that back to a, a, a local support network. So rather than treating everything the same, the flexibility has uh, allowed us to have more meaningful conversations with our branches, our regional teams, and our product teams. Specifically for this COVID-19 period, every product range is getting reviewed. Previously, we were looking at the top three or four, but now this is a perfect example. This is, as, a, as I tell my own team and my own manager who's on the call, is this is the crisis that we need. So we're taking this opportunity to go and review every product range and set ourselves up for the future. It's also focused just within the planning team, making sure that we're looking at causes of unnecessary inventory. What's the uncertainty being created by um, uncertain demand signals? Have we gone and removed all the outliers, for example? Um, how is our supplier die pot going? Can we skinny that up and make that much more certain? Now, for some of you, there'll be cheers. From some of you, there'll be a gas that we didn't have it before. But we have very much got an exec SNOP process that meets weekly from, from not having had one before. 
So we're able to use this situation to make sure that we're engaging through supply chain, product management, sales, and the senior leadership team of this portion of our business, which has been a huge leap forward and also been an education process for not only the senior leadership team and others on all the different elements that we need to knit together and also the compromises required to make this and terms work well. Now, one of the things we've also done is using these support networks to really leverage what we have available to us is we've targeted slow moving ranges in Metro DCs. And by targeting these, and I'll take you through an example in the next couple of slides, which we'll finish with. By targeting these, we're able to be specific to um, branch A versus branch B. Their slow and fast moving ranges are different, but the local DC will be able to lift accordingly. And in our example, we've been able to reduce in, uh, in one of our metro regions by setting those slow moving metro branches to zero, which is around about a two to two and a half million dollar down in min max safety stock calculation. The supporting DC has only had to lift by about $250,000. So a huge difference and recognition that by pooling that uncertainty from five, six, seven branches into one, not only do you reduce those uh, repetitive buffers that you have through our branch network, but also the, the ABC classification or the POPCO classification elevates very fast when you put them all together. So we can actually hold better stock that all those metro branches can, uh, can call off. Now, this support network idea is something that's uh, is new. We've only put this together in the last couple of years um, through a number of conversations and obviously you know, delivered through the software that we're using. And I'm just gonna take you through a very simple um, representation of what this what this does. I'm just trying to move. There we go. Now, imagine this simple example: two branches, some very simplistic ha sales history, and a support warehouse. This support warehouse, in our case, is a distribution center and may have been sending customer direct orders. But we could also configure the support warehouse to be another branch, perhaps one that's just doing better in that range. We can also do support by a brand, if need be, or a product category. So this branch supports others for their bearings, whilst this other one does it for their consumables range. So in this example, we've got some very simplistic sales histories in two branches, and we've connected them to a support location. In very, again, simple safety stock setting, we've set the minimums here at the highest of the past sales. That's actually exactly what our sales guys believe we, we do for them anyway. But as you can see, it creates rather high min, max and safety stock levels. What we do now though is we identify those specific orders for those individual branches as potential outliers or erratic, uncertain to that location. We will then, in our planning methods, we'll add those orders to the support location. And as a result, we'll recalculate the safety stock at that support location. And obviously, we'll then recalculate the min maxes at the branches to make sure that they're holding the, the stock that they require for their general base load sort of demand. But those outliers that we still want to retain in our forecasts and servicing for the future, we've got them local. And by wrapping up, say, a metro area, knowing that they've got milk runs going a couple of times a day, it's, a, it's an idea of being able to maintain as many of those sales whilst not overinflating our stock. And as I mentioned, two and a half million dollars down for 250 up. We were already supporting many of those locations anyway. And our DCs have got a much, much broader range of product, not necessarily in the depth of quantity, but the branches themselves are also out there and stocked up. And with this method, we imagine it like a balloon analogy, where if you squash down the stock in the branches, it will pop up slightly in the DCs. As the branches start selling more, the stock will be uh, sucked towards the branch. As their sales rate decline, it'll be removed from the branch and added to the support network close by. And as the sales, or should the sales decline even further, it will then move back from that support network to our point of purchase. Now, 
the the whole purpose and the results for that though for ourselves is to make sure that we can be much smarter about the stock investment we have move it towards those locations that are either selling or supporting and this has allowed us to do a significant stock down process um, whilst not putting ourselves at risk uh, very much focusing on the inventory portion of that earn and turn triangle but what it's also allowed us to do is to try to get our branches to moving to what we would term a, a DC direct type mindset to allow them to tick off all the sales benefits and have the DC do the hard work and do the picking, packing and uh, ultimate send. Allows the, the, the branch to essentially be selling from a catalog while still maintaining stock in branches. So this has been um, a significant changer for ourselves. We're seeing improvements from our own and turn results from that and has really created that certainty that this is the metric that works for us in this slow moving space. Recognizing though, not necessarily the metric that everyone has in a slow moving space, and obviously it could be different whether you're a manufacturer, whether you're a consumer, you have those critical items yourselves. Uh, the, the, the final thing on this is whilst those min-max calculations for ourselves are auto-generated and calculated, we do have the ability to then go and override any of those results. So again, if a branch was needing to hold something for power station, mine sites, and so on and so forth, then we are able to override that in the branch and immediately the support requirement would stop. And so that, that keeps things in, in perfect tandem for ourselves. Now, I hope that's given you a bit of an insight into how we have done things here at the Enenco Group. Um, I thank you for your time. Um, those of us on the screen now are open for any questions you may have or Monique, if there was a, another portion, that's it from myself. I hope that was have, of use. Uh, thank you, Mark. It's James uh, speaking. Thank you, Mark. Perhaps uh, I might introduce, whilst you take a breath for a second, perhaps I might introduce uh, Omar Ingbar and John Allen from Horizon Inventory. And, and perhaps both of you like to just give us some thoughts on what we've just seen. Is this how you see inventory uh, today? Um, yeah, your thoughts. Perhaps I'll start with John. Would appear John's still on mute. Am I unmute? I, I think I'm unmuted now, aren't I? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, look, before I just answer the question, James, probably, probably what I should do is just say a, a very big thank you to Mark. Um, I think one of the things that's very, very important in this whole, this sort of stuff is there's a lot of innovation, but it only happens because people ask for it and work with you. And Mark has been out, absolutely outstanding in, in throwing up challenging questions and things like that. So I, I think that's, that's been extraordinarily important. Um, the other thing, however, is, you know, you've got to somehow make it simple. And one of the things that, that I'm sure Mark would say is, uh, frequently we deliver the, the world, but he just said, look, just, just, just a smaller amount would, would be fine. And he often has to uh, uh, dumb it down a little bit to, um, to make this uh, final solution practical. But I think that's been a very good process. We work out, you know, just how far we need to push the envelope and uh, it's been great working with Mark. Anything else to say, Ima? No, hi, uh, hi everybody. I think like, you know, just to continue from, I think like, you know, Mark's comments uh, before, I think like, you know, one of the important thing, I think like, you know, we all live in a digital age where we have uh, these wonderful tools where we can harvest and, and utilize for, um, you know, decision-making and getting, you know, clearer visibility around um, our business and the landscape in which we operate. I think like, you know, one of the key, um, I think key learnings that we have had along the way working with Inenco Group is um, really, we need to kind of like, you know, understand the, the context in which um, we operate or the business is operating and really try and harvest, you know, the right um, success that is relevant for the business using the right tool. Because at the end of the day, a tool is a tool and it's really around how it's being used in the context of the business problem it's trying to solve that really makes you know a huge difference and you know mark's example around the support net, uh, 
networks is a perfect example that, that gives um, um, the analogy of, of what that was. That's it for me, sorry. Thanks, uh, uh, Omar. Uh, a question for Mark uh, to begin with from uh, Hoda. Uh, he's asking uh, to clarify the safety stock uh, decision-making process. What items do you keep uh, in state DCs for safety stock and how do you define what volumes to keep? Hmm. So the, the determination of what gets held in those state DCs or the support locations is really dependent upon the downstream sales of the network that they are supporting. So to start with, we don't have any restrictions. We, we don't have that item A or B is not allowed, although we, we're now getting restriction on aerosol cans, for example. But really the determination of the stock that we would hold and the depth that we would hold goes to that last demonstration I had in as much that if the branches themselves have some past sales, but their current min-max strategy is insufficient to cover them, then we'll cover them back at the, the defined support location. And so we very much keep the support location in tandem with the branch. We recalculate that every weekend to make sure that we're taking the latest orders, recalculating the branch. And if they are now able to support themselves, the DC will drop. But if they've experienced some new sales of some uh, unexpected items or unexpected quantities to their usual profile, the DC locally will, will pop up in tandem. So that's, that demonstration on those last few slides is really how we set our local uh, ranging. Yeah, I like it. It's, uh, it's reactive if you're doing it every week, uh, or proactive rather, if you're doing it every week. Uh, the, the next question comes from Simon, and it's the other end of the scale. How do you manage the demand and supply of an item that has a three-year lead time? As best as you can. Um, so three years is really a supplier saying, don't know. In some cases, they don't even know if they have capacity at the end of that three years. So it's very much keeping in touch with the account managers on our side, managing that customer to make sure that we still have a future need for this product. It's also keeping in touch with the supplier to make sure those three years actually will eventuate at some time. But we do have some genuine uh, product that is two, two and a half year in manufacture, such small quantities being brought down to this end of the world compared to the manufacturing capacity they have. So those would be typically ones that we're booking in with mining customers, for example. So account management and ourselves, we need to keep as close as possible, including the supplier. As always, that communication could be done much, much better. Thankfully, these are relatively small number of ranges. It's, it is an exception, and uh, there seems to be a high relationship between length of lead time and cost of item, though, so you do need to keep an eye on these. Um, just from a question from me, do you, do you take out the, the, the outliers in your data? Do you try and work out what your, your mean data is or your average data? Uh, we do. That's probably a different presentation, to be honest. Um, we have a variety of options within our system for identifying outliers, uh, probably about two or three different layers of trying to identify outliers. And John and myself are going backwards and forwards, actually testing a new idea with that at the moment. Um, so, yes, we do have that. We do tend to, again, set our rules and configuration for a rather broad term. But then you always have the ability to go in and clean and do something manually. For example, we may have lost, a, lost an account. We'd take that out uh, manually. We might have had some very unusual orders, but they're not deemed unusual enough by the rules. So we actually have a, a number of methods, and it's something that we're focusing on as we speak, actually. Maybe just one, one extra thing on that, because it is a genuine point of difference from other planning systems is, most systems I would know would be looking at be it monthly, weekly aggregates and determining their sales forecast from that. We have the ability to go down to the individual orders and look to see if this order is unusual in that location. And we can determine it's unusual from a branch yet retain it at a DC. And then having worked out if the orders are relevant or not at that location, then reset our forecasting based on the aggregates, uh, what we call retained orders. James, if I maybe could just add to that, it's John. 
Uh, I think the other thing we've got to recognise is that literally we're dealing with, in the history, something like 15, 16 million order lines. So clearly you cannot do that manually in the main. And while you can do manual overrides, I think one of the things we've learned is you've just got to do it via rules-based engine that decides what's an outlier. And a lot of that work's got to be done for you. It would be literally impossible for Mark and his team to handle it otherwise. There's a few other questions in here as well, I can see. Um, we're not going to get, just given the time, we're not going to get through all these questions. So what I would ask is that as many of you as possible post to that LinkedIn forum um, and be it myself, John, anyone else, I'd be interested to get not only how we do things at Anenco, but also how they do things elsewhere. Um, there was a question I see from Guy about, we've been able to get an SNIP process, one of one of my achievements, I believe, um, and you say, it says to me that the buyers and supply chain team are working well. This is not normal for retailers, I think, um, but that you said was behind your question. Um, we're getting better. I wouldn't say that we're a model SNOP process. Um, however, many of the internal um, difficulties to getting one up and running have not only disappeared within, but also, as I said, we're making the best use of this crisis as we can. And we've, we've demonstrated that this is the process for answering many of the questions that were perhaps leapfrogging the process and going straight to the planners. Um, for example, if someone tells you to stop buying 10%, for example, my first option is typically to say, of what? Uh, and obviously that should be coming from a sales and marketing team. I don't think that should be a supply chain team of working out what we're going to stop selling. Uh, I'm back online, Mark. My apologies for that, but I can't Welcome see. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Love technology. Uh, look, I, I can't see the Q and A's at the moment. So okay, I can uh, help you out there. There's a question here. Do you see an AI-based application that dynamically informs stock decisions? We we don't use an artificial intelligence-based one, um, but we are using something that's very much a rules-based and quite flexible in those rules as well, perhaps up to sort of 20 different parameters to choose from. Um, as with everything, the, the more complicated the set of the rules, the harder it is for you to discover how you've gone and done something. But again, it's something that John and I have even been working on this last few days in trying to discover which rule is used and is it the right one. Um, so not artificial intelligence, but uh, pretty bloody good. Uh, for, for selecting the big orders, um, outliers to be moved to supporting DCs, we're also consider, considering the value of those items orders, or is it based on quantity only? Yep. Um, so at the moment, we take it from a, uh, a, well, we've got two different methods, one of which does go into further optimization, looking at uh, value. The one that perhaps prioritizing at the moment is a step down from that, which is very much looking at the quantities of those. So the quantity in relation to the other orders at that location or the network that that location services downstream. We, we have an impediment of our master data that doesn't show us the true value in the correct location, which is unfortunate. That would be a huge step forward for us. Uh, but from a quantities perspective, we can still do some fantastic outlier identification. Another question here, uh, any implications on the staffing levels? How did you train staff in the new processes? Good question. So this has been a, a multi-year journey. And in that time, we have taken on new recruits as well. So it's kept the, the, the training going. One of my approaches on that is to try to be, uh, try to simplify the process as much as possible. So myself and one or two others behind the scenes will make the system sing and dance the way we need to. Um, try and provide a very simplistic method of, of training, in, be it in demand planning or supply planning, or running our replenishments from DCs to our branches, for example, which for us are nearly 85, 90% auto-released as well. So we had to do the training to make sure that was respected and people had confidence in that. 
so we do have a, a pretty good way i think of having basic introduction to what we do and then with new recruits we typically see within especially the good ones within three four five weeks they're starting to question back because they realize that what we've given them is perhaps a little bit too simplistic and that's where you start getting the engagement in the team so encouraging people to question what they see keep on being curious and we'll align the the people with the questions with those with the knowledge and we're just continually taking things forwards Great answer. Here's another question. What was the impact on transport costs from the change in design to your supply chain? In particular, did you see an increase in expedited delivery costs as a result of removal of stock from the branches? Yes, thank you, Peter, for that one. Um, I don't have an exact number for you. What it's certainly done is identified more what I would term as excess candidates. Um, we now have stock out in branches that we would deem to be excessive, uh, but we are constantly sweeping our branches, looking for excess to be returned from branch to branch or branch back to centralized DCs. And by consolidating back to one of our state centers, we're able to spin it around nationally much easier than 80 branches talking to each other and all the combinations of that would create. So I, I don't to hand have an immediate uh, change in, in freight uh, but what we've seen, though, is we've had a, an overall reduction in our uh, replenishments because we're not sending the same item to 10, 15 locations. We're sending more quantities to fewer, and then we're trying to absorb that in our standard excess return process. Here's another one on forecasting and sales. It's very popular today. Mm. Do you base, base stock levels on historical sales history or forward-looking forecast sales trends? If forward-looking, how do you ensure forecast accountability? So our forecast process is, uh, is multi-led. So we start off by looking for outliers. That begins with looking at the individual orders in their location so as I said, we might have an order that's considered large in a specific branch. That could be knocked out as what we would refer to as a big order or an outlier. But when that same order is assessed back at the purchasing DC or the supporting DC, it may be retained. The exercise of that is to determine all of the orders that we want to retain for our forecast. The, the past, typically you run your algorithms, you get the future. We do have the ability though to um, override both the history for cleaning as well as our forecast in the future which we've been doing to shape our purchasing decisions over the next few months at the same time we also run our forecast accuracy and for that brand that I gave before of the uh, earn and turn improvements we're getting close to 80 percent forecast accuracy on a one month time lag and this is a five day lead time item so one month is a good lag so we are running forecast accuracy measures. 80% for that one was much better than we were expecting. But in most others, we're hitting around about the 55, 60% in forecast accuracy at variable time lags. Uh, and what we're finding our suppliers are identifying that we're probably about 5% or percent more than they would if indeed they even measure this, which most of our suppliers don't. What WMS ERP systems does Anenco use for planning and materials management? So the, the planning system outside of our ERP is called MICQF and is the one that John and Omer um, are able to talk to the most. And we've had that within our business, I think close to 12 or 15 years, um, longer than I've been there myself. Um, from an ERP perspective, we're rolling into a system that was actually built and maintained by a pa uh, parent company in the USA. So not one that's commercially available, but the planning is all outside of that. And it's through the MICQ system hosted by Horizon Imagery. Thank you, Mark. And thank you all. We've hit two o'clock. So it's time for us to go. The Facebook closed, uh, sorry, the LinkedIn closed forum will be open soon. Uh, can I thank you, Mark, for a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Bree, for your introductory remarks, Omer and John for being part of this, and Monique as always for organising. Uh, I think that's it, isn't it, Monique?
That's correct. Thank you everyone for joining. And remember to type CPD in the Q&A box. We'll leave it open for a little while longer. Great to see you. We miss you all and stay safe. Thank you very much. Please make use of the LinkedIn chat room. Thanks everybody.